So good day, everyone. My name is uh, Dr. Ayub Ilyas, and uh, I'm a board certified colorectal and uh, general surgeon. I specialize in uh, minimally invasive uh, surgery, particularly robotic surgery. Other than me being a colorectal surgeon, uh, there's no other disclosures related to the talk. Uh, March is the month of uh, colorectal cancer awareness month. And the month of March had been the rallying point for a uh, colorectal cancer community for a long time, during which uh, thousands of patients, uh, survivors, uh, caregivers, and advocates throughout the country joined together to spread uh, colorectal cancer awareness uh, by wearing blue and uh, holding fundraising and educational events, talking to friends and families about colorectal cancer. And uh, in the year 2000, uh, President Clinton officially dedicated uh, March as the National uh, Colorectal Awareness Month. And uh, cancer is not something any of us want to hear in our personal life, or for that matter, anyone else's life as well. Uh, but we have made a significant progress in the management of various types of cancers. One of the important tools we've been using to manage cancer is to prevent it from developing. By preventing cancer by risk mitigation or risk modification, screening for cancers, and God forbid, if you were to develop one, uh, treat them effectively, both surgical and uh, non-surgical means to attain a uh, cure. The most important message we should spread among ourselves in this month is that majority of colon cancer deaths could be prevented by screening. The blue star and the blue ribbon have been used to spread the awareness uh, during the month of March even otherwise, uh, much like the red ribbons used for uh, AIDS or pink ribbons for breast cancer. So how common is colorectal cancer? The American Cancer Society estimates that we will have about 100,000 colon cancer, just short of 50,000 rectal cancer cases in uh, 2021. And uh, if you look at the statistics, it's the third most uh, diagnosed cancer. Unfortunately, in 2020 and even in 2021, uh, COVID has been the leading cause of death in the United States, uh, particularly in those over, uh, over 45. Traditionally, otherwise coronary artery disease, what we call as heart attacks, is the leading cause of death. Cancer is the second leading cause of death otherwise. And uh, among the different types of cancer, colorectal cancer is the second most common cause of uh, cancer-related deaths. Uh, we unfortunately would expect to lose about 53,000 people to colorectal cancer this year. Are we making progress? Yes, we are. And since mid 1980s, the colorectal cancer rate is decreasing. Uh, mostly due to screening and changes in our lifestyles. And uh, during the last decade, about uh, there has been a drop of about 1% each year, particularly between 2013 and 2017. But we do see an increasing trend in younger population, uh, which has been increasing in uh, incidence by about 2% uh, every year in people who are under 50. So uh, we do see a downward trend in, uh, in more older adults because uh, those are the patient population we are uh, targeting for screening. Death from colorectal cancer is also dropping due to prevention of it and effective treatment of patients with colorectal cancer from advances in various uh, aspects of its treatment, including uh, better surgery, better chemotherapeutic agents and uh, improvements in radiation treatment. How are we reducing colon cancer-related mortality? So uh, screening, 
So column polyps are being identified early and are being removed. We'll talk about it a little bit later about it more in detail. And uh, even those who develop cancer, we are trying to identify them very early. So it's a lot easier to treat. And like I said, uh, treatment for colorectal cancer is improved. And uh, later in the talk, I'll also talk about advances uh, uh, which we have made locally at Eisenhower in the management of, of colorectal cancer over the last many years. So what are our risks? You know, and it's the, the average risk is about one in 20. And, uh, but uh, an individual risk varies with the number of risk factors uh, which we all have for colon cancer. And as we all grow older, uh, the risk uh, continues to increase. So if that is so, how can I reduce my risks? And uh, so what are risk factors? A risk, a risk factor is anything which increases the risk of uh, or raises your chance of getting a disease such as cancer. Different cancers have different risk factors. Some factors can be changed like smoking and others like patient age or genetic factors cannot be changed. So let's look at those factors uh, which uh, can be modified uh, which will affect the chances of us uh, getting colorectal cancer. So the factors which can be changed are being obese or overweight increases our risk for colon cancer, uh, particularly for men more than women, but it does increase for both of them. And uh, if you're not physically active, it does increase the risk. Regular, moderate, vigorous physical activity can lower your risk Again, cooking meats at very high temperature, like frying, grilling, creates chemicals that have been shown to increase the cancer risk. And uh, like I said, red meat and processed meat as well. And uh, lower blood level of vitamin D has also been shown to increase the risk. And smoking. Uh, smoking is not just linked with lung cancer. Like I say to my patient, it, uh, increase the risk of cancer from the oral to the aboral end, including uh, many important organs in the body, including uh, colon and rectum. And uh, alcohol use, moderate to heavy use, has been associated with increased risk of colon cancer. Unfortunately, even light to moderate intake has been shown to increase the risk uh, of, of colon cancer somewhat. To be honest, and essentially, if you have a very healthy living and avoid smoking and alcohol, it does reduce the risk of colon cancer. And the risk you cannot change, being older. I wish I can stop uh, growing older, but we all can. So the risk of colon cancer increases with age. And if we have had previous colonoscopies and those colonoscopies showed the polyps or if unfortunately a person had developed colon cancer previously, they are at a higher risk of colon cancer again. And the personal history of inflammatory bowel disease like uh, Crohn's disease or ulcerative colitis can also increase the risk of colon cancer. And uh, if anyone from the family has a colon cancer or adenomatous polyps, particularly if they are first degree relatives and particularly if they're younger in age, it does increase the risk of colon cancer. And uh, inherited syndromes uh, also risk the, increase the risk of colon cancer. Uh, these are like Lynch syndrome, FAP syndrome, and so on. Some of these Lynch syndrome has a risk for up to about 50% risk of developing colon cancer in their lifetime. But uh, familial adenomatous uh, polyposis has 100% risk of developing colon cancer. So also I want to mention that younger adults uh, can also get colon cancer. In fact, the incidence of colon cancer in younger adults, like I said earlier, is increasing and we diagnose about 18,000 colon cancer per year in the United States in patients who are under 50. And uh, like I said, as you grow older, the risk increases uh, uh, and uh, from the family history point of view, one in three people who've developed colorectal cancer have other family members who have had it. So it's important to know the 
how the history or the health history of the family members and another reason why we should be in good terms with the folks who share our gene pool. And uh, why do colon cancers run in family? Uh, it's not always genetics. Genetics plays a major part, but it's not always genetics. Maybe uh, we also share the same environmental factors or a combination of uh, all of these factors. So uh, I, I also want to point out that we are more likely to know family members who developed a colon cancer, but those who have not had polyps, like advanced polyps, we call it. So it is important to know uh, the findings of the colonoscopy details of our family members to evaluate your own risk for colon cancer. Bottom line is staying connected to your family members is important uh, uh, to know your own uh, risk for colon cancer. And uh, like I said earlier, uh, in younger folks, uh, there's been a huge interest in this uh, patient uh, population. Uh, there has been an alarming increase, which we have see, been seeing lately. And this is not just seen in the United States. We see that in other countries like Canada and Australia as well. And a lot of times, uh, hemorrhoidal bleeding is so common that if a younger patient uh, develops uh, bleeding per rectum, it's put down to hemorrhoids and uh, that leads to delay in diagnosis. So it's important to keep in the back of the mind that uh, cancer is also a possibility both in younger men and women. And uh, let's look at three things to know about colon cancer in this month. Uh, it's those three things are colon cancer is preventable, it is treatable, and it is beatable, meaning it's curative. Uh, we need to spread this message uh, uh, in our community, to our family members, our friend circles. And uh, it is important to maintain good health, like I said, to stop smoking, watch your weight, stay active, watch our diet, alcohol, and getting screened. And very important that seven in 10 of the colorectal cancers don't show any symptoms. So getting tested is an important uh, information we need to spread. It's an important tool in our fight against cancer, uh, particularly in breast cancer and colon cancer. Uh, when you compare breast cancer screening like mammogram uh, with the colon cancer screening, uh, the screening for colonoscopy not just identifies uh, the polyps, but also helps treat them and prevent it. It's just not identification, but it's also preventing it because we can take care of those polyps early and uh, prevent them from developing into cancers. So why do we screen for uh, colon and rectal cancer? What is the rationale? So this is what it is. This is a picture showing the inner lining of the colon and rectum. And, uh, if you look at it on the left side, uh, those adenomatous polyps, so these are few abnormal cells. They slowly grow on to become polyps. These are usually about two to three millimeters. Then they go on to become uh, five millimeters, 10 millimeters. They go on to enlarge in size. They show some precancerous changes. And after some time, they go on to become non-invasive cancer and then invasive cancer. But the good thing is it takes about 10 to 15 years so with regular screening, we will be able to identify these polyps at an early stage and uh, remove them, like literally like saying, nip it in the bud stage. And uh, also look, if you look at the cancer, uh, it's uh, stage zero is a non-invasive cancer. And if it involves only partially the wall is stage one, most of the wall is stage two, goes beyond the wall into the lymph nodes, it becomes stage three. If it goes beyond the lymph nodes into other organs in the body, it becomes stage four in, in, in simple terms. It's always easier to manage those tumors when they are very early in the stages than in a later stage. So even if someone were to develop colon cancer, regular screening colonoscopy helps us identify these tumors at an early stage. And uh, now what are the screening guidelines? Uh, when do we start to screen? You know, there's been a little uh, uh, talk about, we all know 50 years is when we all need to get colonoscopies. Now uh, there's been a push towards 45. 
Uh, and uh, in a traditional recommendation in a normal risk patient for a, a screen colonoscopy is 50. But like I mentioned earlier, there's been increasing incidence of colorectal cancer in younger age. And uh, so the American Cancer Society has recently changed the recommendation to 45 years of age. It was initially changed to only among African-Americans and now it's changed to everybody else. So starting at the age of 45, uh, uh, we should continue to have regular uh, screening of tests. And uh, we'll talk about the different types of tests available. These start date may have to be earlier if there's a family history of colon cancer, depending on the age during which your family member had developed colon cancer. And if you have, there are any syndromes in the family or inflammatory bowel disease like ulcerative colitis or Crohn's disease and so on. And uh, Family history of uh, colorectal cancer or history of adenoma, like I mentioned earlier as well. People who are in good health and with a life expectancy of more than 10 years should continue to have uh, a regular screening for colorectal cancer till the age of 75. Between 76 and 85, the decision for screening should be based on a patient's uh, preferences and looking at their generalized health status and life expectancy, overall health, and prior screening history as well. These, uh, what I'm talking about, these are only for screening guidelines. If uh, anyone were to develop symptoms, which could be uh, uh, pain, uh, but in, in cancer, you can understand most of the time, pain is a late event and changes in bowel habits or bleeding per rectum or weight loss, these are or loss of appetite. These are all uh, could be signs of colorectal cancer. If uh, those who develop anemia because of uh, microscopic blood loss is one of the more common reasons why we do colonoscopies in patients looking for colon cancer. These are symptomatology. When I say screening, it's for asymptomatic patients. And uh, anyone over 85, if they don't have any symptoms, we no longer recommend uh, colorectal cancer screening. So what are the screening tests available? Uh, there are stool-based tests and visual examination tests. The screening can be done by uh, uh, either of them. And uh, in the stool-based test, we are looking for a signs of cancers in a person's stool and uh, a visual exams involve a colonoscopy or radiological exam, we'll look at it in a minute. And the stool-based tests include fecal occult blood tests or, uh, or uh, what we call as fecal immunochemical test and the cologuard, which is a DNA test, a stool DNA test. Uh, the first two, two uh, FOBT and FIT tests needs to be done per year. And if it is normal, uh, uh, cologuard tests need to be repeated every three years, once every three years. And cologuard, uh, uh, a little bit more information because uh, a lot of patients would like to know, now it is 92% sensitive on the trial, which means it cologuard can detect 92% of the cancers. But unfortunately, it can develop, uh, it can detect only less than half, that is about 42% of uh, precancerous polyps. That's a, a kind of a disadvantage with it. And, but it is definitely better than other, uh, the stool-based test, and uh, which are about only 70% sensitivity. Also, there is about uh, a 12% false positive rate with uh, cologuard, meaning you don't have anything, but cologuard uh, says we need to uh, investigate further. It is recommended by United States Preventative Services Task Force. And uh, Cologar obviously is just looking at the DNA, so we do not remove polyps. So if it's positive, you need a colonoscopy. And, and those who have high risk of colon cancer, uh, you cannot do uh, Cologar, but you would need to do uh, a full colonoscopy. And you may have to talk to your uh, primary practice physician or with your gastroenterologist about it. And when you compare colonoscopy with cologuard, cologuard is obviously less accurate than a colonoscopy. Colonoscopy is about 95% uh, uh, sensitive and can detect cancers and polyps as well. And the visual examination of colon rectum, uh, the evergreen uh, colonoscopy, as we all know, 
and those who cannot have colonoscopies for various reasons, we can do the same with a CT scan. It's a virtual colonoscopy, and it has to be done every five years if it's in a screening population, if it's a normal. And colonoscopy is done every 10 years if you don't have, if they don't find any polyps, and it's, it's a good quality study as well. Flexible sigmoidoscopy is examination of, uh, similar to colonoscopy, but examining only the left side of the colon. And if uh, we could do only that, we don't normally routinely do that because we'd like to examine the entire colon. If it is done, it needs to be done every five years. Screening for high-risk patients, uh, those include uh, patients, uh, this needs to be, these are people at increased or high risk for colon cancer. I mean, we need to start earlier, uh, like I mentioned earlier as well, with those we have a strong family history of colorectal cancer, or they have had personal history of colorectal cancer, or some advanced polyps, or inflammatory bowel disease like ulcerative colitis or Crohn's, or they have any cancer syndromes, like I mentioned earlier, or if they've had any radiation to the pelvis from any prior uh, uh, cancer or so. And in those situations, you would need to discuss with your primary physician or gastroenterologist. A little bit about colonoscopy, we all know a lot about it. And uh, it's a main screening tool used, and it is one of the main reasons why we have seen decreasing incidence and uh, decreasing uh, mortality related to colon cancer. And uh, the most unpleasant aspect of a colonoscopy is the bowel prep, but it is important to have a good bowel prep because the sensitivity of the exam depends on how well the bowel prep is. If the gastroenterologist is not able to see, then the sensitivity of the st study decreases. It, uh, but unfortunately, it is an interventional test, meaning there's a small risk associated with the sedation related to the procedure and also the technicality associated with the procedure. Uh, but the most important aspect of colonoscopy is that not only detects colon polyps or colon cancer early, but it also helps remove them. Even some of the early colon and rectal cancer can be removed endoscopically without surgery in selected instances. So like I mentioned, uh, it takes about 10 to 15 years for the polyp to develop the cancer, so uh, we can make use of colonoscopy to reduce the risk. And uh, this is what happens. What you see on the left upper quadrant is the polyp, and uh, uh, that's a snare being applied. If you see on, uh, they're injecting a little dye on the base so that when they go back next time, they can look at the site particularly. They injected the dye on the, uh, on the picture on the B, and left lower, they are putting a snare, literally like a snare, and which uh, would apply some elect uh, electricity or current or thermal energy and they cut it off and examine under microscopy. Sometimes uh, some of these tumors in the lower rectum can also be removed using a robotic surgery without any incisions. So a little bit about treatment of colorectal cancer. I'm a colorectal surgeon and uh, I, I would uh, go a little bit uh, into the surgical aspects of it. The various treatment options, as you all know, include surgery, chemotherapy, and radiation therapy. But surgery to remove the involved part of the colon or rectum plays an important role in the management of colorectal cancer. And a little bit about the surgery for colorectal cancer. The surgery depends on the stage of the cancer and where is the colon cancer or rectal cancer is located. We all know about open surgeries, then came the era of laparoscopic surgery. And these days uh, we do a lot of robotic surgeries and something uh, new, which is the natural orifice surgery that I'll explain briefly at the end. And uh, there's been a lot of misconception about robotic surgery, if, uh, and uh, I wanted to let you know it is, it is definitely a misnomer. The surgeon does the entire operation. There is no automation involved. It's just a cool name, and uh, I like to be called a robotic surgeon. And uh, this is a more advanced laparoscopy with, a, with more, uh, uh, a lot of advantages. This is a typical robotic operating room for you to understand the patient in the middle on the operating room table connected to the robot. The operating surgeon is sitting in the same room on a console and the patient is connected to, to the uh, surgeon through the main computer, which you see on the left. And the nurse and the scrub tech in the operating room helps doing the operation. This is the robot, and it's unlike 
If I were to operate, I only have two hands, but with the use of robot, literally like me having two more arms. So literally like me times two operating together with full sync. And uh, so uh, uh, that's what it is. Now you see the patient connected to the robot. And this is the main computer. Literally, I want to see you like, we call it a vision card, the main computer in the room. And uh, this is where the surgeon sits and does the operation like you see here now. And uh, why, what are the advantages of robotic surgery? It significantly improves the visualization of critical structures. The optics are uh, phenomenal. You get a 3D vision, the depth perception. Critical structures are identified very clearly. You see a much better than what you would see with the naked eye. And some of these uh, uh, CT scan x-rays could also be combined on the patient anatomy, making uh, surgical planning and critical operation extremely important. And uh, so apart from visualization, the uh, incisions are smaller and uh, which means cosmetically it's better and minimal scarring, it's just not scarring outside, scarring inside the abdomen. So it has been shown to be, have a lot less complications because there is decreased in the incision size, particularly so uh, less narcotics are needed, particularly in this, uh, we are going through an endemic in narcotic uh, abuse across the country. There are uh, instances where I do colectomies and patient may not have to have even a single tablet of uh, opioids post-operatively. And even my own practice so from a, from a seven day length of stay across the country, we have seen it uh, decrease to between one and two days. That's a significant decrease. So if I can get, have a patient go through a, an important major operation, I'm able to get him or her home in one or two days. And uh, that's, uh, that's, that's phenomenal. And uh, that means faster recovering, recovering to their own uh, uh, regular lives is early as well. And uh, this is what a typical open operation wound for a cancer, let's say a rectal cancer would look like in a good open operation. And uh, some of these scars could be longer, but in a robotic operation, a welding operation would look immediately like that. And later on, these scars heal pretty well. And, uh, and all of us, uh, if we can manage with a smaller scar, we prefer to have smaller cars, scars. So uh, what is natural artifact surgery? It is exactly what it sounds like. And uh, we remove uh, some of these rectal cancer tumors uh, uh, through natural artifacts through the anus and uh, no incision. So uh, less pain or majority of them have no pain in fact. And it is less morbid than open operation or having to do uh, what we call a stance abdominal operations. And obviously they get better. These are some of the cool pictures of early robots, which I took uh, from one of the robotic companies, uh, which I visited. And uh, there's been a lot of development since in the, in the last 20 years in the robotic field. And it has transformed uh, uh, surgery a lot more. I, I say that because I think uh, be, be surgeons along with the, with the industry and with the scientists are trying to make surgery more patient friendly. This is a single port, a single incision. Uh, you put it down and do the surgery. It's called single port robot. And uh, we continue to make uh, progress. And Eisenhower and innovation, particularly I need to mention this because uh, particularly in colon cancer, there is uh, advanced uh, GI interventions are possible. Uh, like if there is an early cancer or advanced tumor, which routinely done, uh, which would need surgery, uh, could be removed by advanced GI. And like I mentioned about advances in surgery and advanced latest chemotherapeutic agents and in MRI imaging and with radiation therapy, these all uh, what it cumulatively uh, does to the patient is uh, if uh, anyone were to be unfortunately diagnosed with colon cancer, help them with uh, be the best possible treatment available uh, across the world is available like, uh, locally here uh, in, in the Valley. And uh, Eisenhower Foundation has been in the forefront making all of these above innovations possible for the patients locally so they don't have to uh, go to uh, uh, big cities for uh, their uh, colorectal cancer. And again, uh, 
uh, this is only possible because of the support of the hospital and the foundation by the local community. And, uh, and uh, I wanted to show a few important websites. Uh, if you wanted to take a look, it's cancer.gov and uh, coloncancerallianceorg fight colon care, fight colorectalcancer.org and colon cancer coalition.org. And again, I want to end with this important message that majority of uh, colon cancer deaths could be prevented with screening. Uh, thank you.